we were in this passage in Colossians 1.16, and I told, normally my staff will ask me if I want the border race. I said, no, leave it up there because there are some important things I want to talk about. So here's what's interesting. We have these certain words here, thronoi, thrones, kuriotetes, lordships, if you will, archai, ruler, and exousiai, authorities. These are all the things that says that Christ created all these things. So I thought we should take a good look before we go too far away from this for another reason. And let me start first with, I'm going to look at this word, thronoi. Now, there's a whole host of ways to approach this, but I thought the best way would be to pull out the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. You know how much I love dictionaries? All right, we're going to read the whole thing. We have an hour. Just joking. (laughs) All right. So, the word throne in the New Testament, you've got at least, you have at least seven different ways of understanding when this word appears. So, you've got heaven as God's throne. Tell you what we'll do kind of maybe give you a couple of examples, not too many, but a couple, just for each one of the six or something. We'll try this. So heaven is God's throne. If you want to turn to Isaiah 66 and verse 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? So you can see that the heaven's my throne You've got more examples, but I'll just say, if you, want, if you want an example from the New Testament, you'll find that another example of that in the New Testament in Matthew 5. And if you don't want to turn, I'll just read it to you in Matthew 5 and verse 34. This is Jesus speaking. Says He says, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. So you have that one use there. The second use of this word is the reference to the throne of David, which speaks of a king, an earthly king's throne, and equally of the line descending ultimately to Christ. So that reference, if you turn to Luke, for example, in Luke 1.52, a lot of times you're going to read in, in the King James, seats. The word for seats will also be thrones, thronoi. So, for example, in Luke 152, he hath put down the mighty from their seats, from their thrones, and exalted them of low degree. There's actually another reference there in 132. Luke 132, he shall be great, speaking of Christ, he shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. So you can see that's another way of using it. Then there is the throne of glory. And there we can, there's so many references to this, I won't even bother, just write it down somewhere, you can look it up for yourself. There is the throne of grace, how, for example, he he ever liveth to make intercession for us, but we are allowed to essentially approach the throne of grace, we're told boldly. There's the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb, you'll find a plethora of those references, primarily in the book of Revelation And then the throne of Satan and the beast, if you're interested in that, you've got to go to Revelation as well. I'll show you where that reference is. Most of you who know your Bible will know in the seven churches, 2 and verse 13. I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, that is throne. All right? So you have the reference there. There's actually multiple references to the throne of Satan and the throne of the beast. And then finally, the one I want to look at is the throne as a class of angels. I had to do this to show you that there's different uses of the word. And this dictionary, which is pretty exhaustive, gives you those six. I'm not reading all the minutia of it. I'm just telling you these are the bullet points that I'd like to point out. Now, this article basically says invisible powers, which like other creatures were created in him, that was our text, include not only, this book is written in Greek, it includes not only kyriotete, lordship, 
It includes also archae and exousiae, but also, and first of all, the word we're looking at, thronoi. So it's important to understand, and I thought I would take the time to do this here. We're dealing with, when it says things created, visible and invisible. We're talking about here, if you see the nature of what is being basically mentioned in the second chapter of Colossians, we know that some part of this community came into the church and basically there was this drive or this push to worship angels. There's actually a whole study or a subcategory. If you study angels, it's called angelology. If you if you're looking at these words, that's my mind first went to, that's an interesting way of describing things visible and invisible. But my curiosity went to, what did Paul mean by this? Did he mean when he said all things were created in heavens and upon the earth, seen and the unseen? Was he talking about, use, by using these words, is he talking about unseen and in the good? And we're looking at categories. So if you go back into church history, ecclesiastical history, you find that in the early ages, there were at least two or three individuals who basically identified nine classes of angels. I do not adhere to that, but definitely realize that there are categories. I'd not even really stopped to consider it as a study. Why? Because we're told both in Colossians 2, and I believe it's verse 18, uh, we're not to worship, we do not. Colossians 2, and I believe it's 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, uh, voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. We're told over and over again, that's just one. If you want the other, the real example of not worshiping angels in Revelation 19, John basically throws himself down at the feet of an angel. Uh, 1910, I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. So essentially, we're not to worship angels. Now, there are words that I've pointed out here. Thrones, lordship, rulers, authorities. But there are other words, for example, that we've dealt with in Ephesians 6.12, or 6, 11, 12 and onwards, those principalities, powers, cosmocratoros. There's a whole host of names that we could study. And if I was going to kind of just call out some of the orders, if you will, because I've been going at this and trying to sort this out, you've got categories of angels. Some we can read about in the Bible, such as seraphim and cherubim. And, for example, the seraphim that are mentioned in Isaiah, uh, the opening chapter of Isaiah and onward, and there is also a mention of the seraphim, I believe, one reference out of Revelation. These fit in their own category with their own assignment. If you read, for example, where you encounter the seraphim in, in Isaiah, they're basically by the vision of God and by the throne of God. So it's safe to say the, the seraphim are connected in some capacity to the throne. Now, that means they may work around the throne, they may worship around the throne, and they have a very peculiar description of how many wings that they have, which is interesting, but they also have characteristics of humans. And then you move into another category, which is the cherubim. And by the way, these are Hebrew words, so the im tells you that they are in the plural. Um, seraph or serapha in Hebrew would be burning or the burning ones. Cherubim, which is not, you know, the picture of a fat baby, fat pudgy babies wearing snug fitting diapers and carrying little harps and arrows. But these are also around the throne but have a different function. And if we were studying in the category of cherubim, we would find Lucifer is there, as he is basically part of that category of angelic beings, although now he has fallen. By the way, his name, 
It's a tragedy when you start to read and understand names and meanings. For example, Lucifer, which comes to us from Latin as light bearer. So he was once light bearer. And equally known, by the way, as you read in the book of Revelation about the morning star, which is Christ. But Lucifer was known as the morning star in the creation event. That's before creation. And they were there witnessing the creation the angelic band, you find that reference in Psalm 148 and verse 5 that explains to us that the angels are created. They were present at creation. So when people talk about angels, it's important to put categories of things. There are also, we've looked at the word thronoi, and the throne, as I just finished reading a short article, usually has to do with a seat of power or those who work around the seat of power. Dominions, which are celestial beings. And then there's a second rank, virtues. There's, I mean, if you start studying this, and it's not to worship, it's to better understand, you come away with some better idea that maybe there are a lot more things on angels in the Bible. I mean, I always kind of treated the subject as a little bit out there, but you start to realize that there are more references to angels and what they do as you go through the Bible, which I'm going to show you just using the Pentateuch. It's kind of baffling. It's mind-boggling. But we have other information that we know about the angels, such as they're not subject to death. They do not procreate, which begs a big question you're going to hear me tackle at least I'm going to ask the question. I may not give you the answer. Um, the great debate, for those of you who know your Bible, in Genesis 6, when it says that the sons of God mated with the daughters of men, and the debate is, are the sons of God, which is usually that, that expression is used of angels and angelic beings. You can find that same expression in the book of Job, so, or many different places. So that, that question there is, Well, if angels don't procreate, how did the sons of God mate with the women of the earth and produce children? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, and uh, next week's message will be... (laughs) Okay, so we know that the rebellion of Satan, we have it chronicled for us both in Isaiah and Ezekiel, and if time permits for those people who may not have a Bible, uh, I may read, but I want to try and get to the, the bullet points here. Equally, we know that angels play an important part in, we'll call it in the end times, in the end of this dispensation. Why? Because the first thing that happens when Christ returns, there's, a, there's talk of the host of angelic beings that will be with him. There's a whole reason why we should look into this subject, if only to make sure that we understand there are things we can glean out of looking at examples. And I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to use the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, to point out how marvelous, if you really start studying this. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I just have to come out and say it, and however you take this, you take it, Okay. Coming from my background, probably I was maybe steeped in in the wrong type of angel study, all right, just like the wrong type of a lot of things. But say over the last 25 years, I've looked on the subject more as it's a more serious thing, especially with those angels, the appearance of those angels that are frightening. They're not quite inviting why people fell down and acted as if they were dead in the Bible upon seeing these things because I believe they were frightful. They weren't warm and inviting. I believe if you think about it, what, what type of a reaction could you have if you were looking at something that, if we understand some of the descriptions, are enormous in their presence, in their stature, if they're able to be seen? Some of them come across as with the ability to morph from their status, the seraphims, for example, burning the burning ones, which relates a little bit to the fire of God, 
and then at the same time how they can shift to have the appearance of a man, which many times I'll say the angel had a face, it had hands, it had feet, and sometimes was mistaken for, like in the passage in Genesis 18 and 19, actually it's Genesis 18 on the plains of Mamre, when it says the angel of the Lord and God himself appeared there, but with a few other men with him. And, and it specifically says these had the form, or at least Abraham refers to them as men. He doesn't say they had wings. He calls them men in many different other times. And this is why I think it's amazing. You can take the Old and the New Testament and recognize these are not different doctrines and one speaker saying one thing, contradicting another. What did Abraham do upon seeing this, we'll call it, man of God, apparition, and his company of men with him? He went straightway, started making cakes and food and preparing, right? Well, doesn't the book of Hebrews say you're supposed to take care? Who knows? You may be entertaining angels unawares. And we kind of have this, just like the way we view the devil, it's a caricature. We think we'd be able to see an angel with the halo and the wings and woohoo, right? Now, check out if you think that that's what you should be looking for. Come back in about an hour when I'm done. But for those of us who know what I just said, it's a little bit more complex and it's not a fairy tale fabrication. We're looking at the record we have from Scripture. Now, what I did was I took the time, and it was kind of a little bit consuming, and this is in my handwriting, which I always hate doing because when you write as much as I do, sometimes I can't even read my own handwriting, which is interesting. I write notes for what? All right. So I want you to take a look at this. You have two headings here, good and evil. And I put down here the first three examples that I could put under the evil And I'll I'll come back to these because they deserve to be explained. But I immediately go to, in the good column, to Genesis 3.24, when it says, And God placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword. And this is what I want to say to you. You'll often find in Scripture, associated with the cherubims, you'll find fire. You'll find there, there are things we can... I'm going to go away from this, so... I don't want you guys to be sick when I move papers around. All right. I put on my notes here, on guarding and protecting the sacred place, guarding the way back to the tree of life, because that's why God put the cherubim there and the flaming sword. This points back to the eternal way that God had planned, but it also points forward to the way of Christ. If you think about it, you take this figure of the cherubims that eventually will appear when Moses is given the directive to build the Ark of the Covenant, these cherubim figures will appear with wings folded facing each other on the Ark cover, which will become known as the mercy seat where the sprinkling of the blood occurred once a year on the Day of Atonement, that in and of itself pointing to Christ. So don't just think of the cherubim and the flaming sword as protecting the way for them to not access the tree of life, but also think of it as a prototype to point us to the tree of life that is spoken to in the book of Revelation. And the only way to get there in the new dispensation is through Christ, the shed blood of Christ. So when you leave Genesis 3.24, and this is what I want to start picking apart, you get into Genesis 16. You've got a whole scenario with Abraham who has taken Hagar to produce children when God gave a promise that that Abraham who had no children and was known as Abram would be father of many but he had no children that promise was given and 25 I want to say it but 25 marvelous years passed (laughs) never mind if you've ever waited on God for anything, you know, you know what I was trying to say. But in the meantime, Abraham and his wife, Sarai, took it into their own hands, pun intended possibly, <laughs> to make a child that was not the child that God promised. God said, 
Sarai is going to have a child. He, they were both old. This is part of the impossibility of this is, you know, what do you do after she's no longer able and he may no longer be able, but God says, hey, that's the promise. You're going to have a child. And that child from that child essentially will be like the stars and the heavens and the sand of the sea from that descending from that child. And when you don't have a child and you're given that promise, you either think God's a lunatic, he's pretty darn cruel, or if he said it, it's going to happen. But time was passing so instead of waiting on God to make good, Abraham, as I said, did what he did and took Hagar, that would be Sarai's handmaid, and had a child with that woman that was not part of God's plan. That child's name is Ishmael, and Ishmael become father to the descendants in the Arab nation. But what happens here, there are two events that happen. You might as well go there. In Genesis 16 and verse 7, and the angel of the Lord, you're going to see that there are mostly in the Pentateuch, it extends beyond the Pentateuch, but the use of the angel of the Lord, which no one person can know definitively if the angel of the Lord is a Christophany or a Theophany, that is the pre-incarnate Christ appearing as the angel of the Lord. And there is another expression, not to be confused, angel of the Lord and angel of God. And actually, these would be two different entities, if you will. So I don't want to say right now, my focus is not to try and figure out who the angel of the Lord is, whether it's an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord, or if this is a Christophany or a Theophany in appearance, if you will. But I want to show you and it, when it says, And the angel of the Lord found her, that's Hagar, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, Whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress. And I want you to take a look at something. The angel knew exactly where she was. He knew exactly who she was. He didn't say, hey, you crazy woman over there. He called her name and said, Hagar. Now, you know, at some point, you see a pattern in the Bible and books written by different people saying very similar things, and you, you either have to conclude one of two things. This is a group of people throughout hundreds, if not thousands of years, who are all deluded at different times in different places, or they all had a similar experience. I choose the latter because we're talking about hundreds of years, once you leave the Pentateuch and even crossing into the New Testament where you see these repeated scenarios. So the angel knows exactly who she is, knows her name, knows that she, if you read on to the next one, she says, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sariot. She only answered one part of the question. There's, two, there's a two-part there. He asks, where are you coming from and where are you going? She only answers one part, fleeing from the face of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. So very interesting. The question being asked, obviously the angel's not asking out of ignorance or like, gee, I, I'm not sure where you were. There's absolute knowledge. And this is what's interesting because in the category, in the hierarchy, not all have the ability to have this knowledge, which is why I lean towards this being a Christophany when it says angel of the Lord. But I'm just telling you in different categories, not all, not all of these created ones have all of the knowledge and all of the wisdom, and they're not omniscient or omnipresent. or So it, you get the point of what I'm saying. He gives her an order and says, return to thy mistress. He doesn't say if you feel like it. He says, return, which is an order, and submit yourself. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for the multitude. So he not only tells her to go back, return to your mistress, and submit to her, but he also guarantees a future to her, your I'm going to multiply your seed exceedingly, not be able to count for the multitude. 
And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. So not only did he say, Go back and submit. Not only did he say to her, You, you have a future. I'm going to multiply your seed. But he says, You're with child. That's like the trifecta right there. And what I find interesting, you know, we can often read through this passage and not recognize the criteria or more the characteristics of this angel or his capacities, if you will, because he goes on to say, not only will you have a child, but he goes on to say, you're going to call your child's name Ishmael. Okay, it's getting a little freaky now, right? That's a little bit too much for me. And then if that's not enough, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what your son's going to be. He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. She called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me, the God that sees me. So whether or not, because she's identifying what she saw as God, I lean towards the fact that this is a Christophany, but nevertheless, angel of the Lord. So what we can know from this passage is that it contains clear understanding, even if we are talking about the highest rank in the order of things of of what we're discussing, for this angel to not only have direct knowledge of the individual, know their name, know all about them, and be able to give a word about the present, you're with child, the future, you'll name him Ishmael, and a little bit about what that child will become. That's kind of mind-boggling. And if you you think, well, okay, that's, uh, okay, whatever. But as I mentioned, Genesis 18. So turn there. In Genesis 18, you've got, this is the Lord appearing. That's how the passage opens. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door, he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, lifted up his eyes, and lo, three men stood by him. This is what's interesting. It doesn't say three angels. It says three men. And you'll begin to see as you study these, sometimes it's hard to know whether these are men, or whether these are angels. So it's important to pay attention to the context. But in this context, very interesting. Abraham, basically, in this moment, he's going to go and get them food. He wants to entertain them, and he wants to serve them. Let me fetch a little bit of bread and water. Let me feed you. Let me entertain you which is why I dovetailed this and said, you know, you can superimpose, I think it's Hebrews 13, 2. Did he even know who he was entertaining? Well, certainly he says the Lord appeared unto him, but who are the three men? Nevertheless, I'm telling you, what I'm saying is that Scripture confirms itself. Now, kind of interesting because in Genesis 18, we have the promise of a son. We also have... the the bad news given about Sodom and Gomorrah, which takes you into the 19th chapter. And that's where I want you to look and see. The 19th chapter just opens with, and there came two angels to Sodom at even. Just matter-of-factly. These angels, they appeared as ordinary men. This whole, if you read this whole passage, they appeared as ordinary men, and the men of the village, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, sought to uh, do certain things to these angels. And we're not going to touch that. Uh, I don't know any, anyone that would. But the angels actually went to Sodom and Gomorrah with a mission. And the mission is to investigate Sodom's sin and execute God's judgment. And if you read through the passage, you recognize Lot welcomed like Abraham offered hospitality to the angels when he said, come in and stay with me. Now, his may have been one part hospitality and one part because he was trying to get the angels or the two men inside his house because he saw the village, the villagers coming out and basically going for, they wanted these two individuals. What's interesting is that the angels basically say, if you read, In verse 13, we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So sometimes angels come and they deliver a message, a word, a thought of God, and other times they are carrying out 
actions on behalf of God, like this particular thing when it says that God began to rain down fire and brimstone. Now, whether he did that through the beckoning of the angels or whether he did that on his own, that's kind of gray area. But he sent them for this purpose, to seek out, and it was Abraham saying, if there's so many righteous people, will you spare Sodom for this purpose alone? But none were to be found, so you know the story Sodom and Gomorrah begins to be destroyed and Lot is escaping. You know that Lot's wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. But if you read the dialogue between Lot and the angels, the angels and the villagers, it makes very clear that these people, these messengers, they are not just coming and flapping their wings or they're, they're not caricatures. They came to execute judgment. Now, turn to Genesis 21 with the birth of Isaac. And now Abraham is going to send Hagar and Ishmael away because Sarai says, you got to send Ishmael away. The reason was Ishmael, who was a teenager, is chiding and mocking the young Isaac making fun of him. See, in every part of the Bible, if you read it, there's always double and triple meaning because Paul takes that same passage and talks about in Galatians, the children of disobedience versus the heirs of salvation. The children of disobedience are the people still today who make a mockery of people and their faith versus those people who will stay by God's word, stay by the stuff, no matter what. So there's always this double interpretation. But here at this time, at this particular place, it says that Abraham listened to his wife and basically says, kick the the mother and her son out. So if you read in 21, beginning at verse 17, when it said, God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? What is wrong with you? What is your problem? Put it in today's verbiage, all right? Then he says, Fear not, for God had heard the voice of the lad where he is. Now, again, this is either delusion or this conversation actually took place. Why? Because, listen, verse 18, Arise, lift up the lad, Hold him in thine hand, and I will make him a great nation. God opened her eyes. She saw a well of water. She went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. So basically, here, the angel not only opens her eyes, saves her and the child from dying of thirst, but another reiterated promise, I will make him a great nation. And the fact that the angel is asking, What's wrong with you? Don't be afraid. God's heard the voice of your son where he is. There's all of this immediate connection to say the angels here, or this particular angel, is not coming and taking the place as an intermediary to to do all, but is communicating a word of God to that individual. If you go to Genesis 22... And verse 11, this is where Abraham is going to take Isaac because he, he it, it opens up with God did tempt Abraham to see what was in his heart because he loved Isaac now, who he really was his only and true begotten son. This is all typifying Christ, by the way. Go and offer your son, your only begotten son on Mount Moriah. That was God wanting to see what was in Abraham's heart. God is not someone who tells you to go out and kill your child. He wanted to know that he had Abraham's complete trust and obedience. When he knew he had it, it says in verse 11, the angel of the Lord called out to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said to him, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. So you get a clear picture Again, whether this angel of the Lord, which here I believe once more is a Christophany, what we're talking about, we will get into another category of angels and their comportment and what they do. So it's important to see here we have angels that can come and help 
They can come and give guidance. Now, I think as we move into the New Testament, you're going to see a little bit of a shift. And I'll say this now because some of you might be thinking, okay, well, you said at the beginning of the message, we're not to worship angels. That's correct. And I only mentioned Colossians 2.18 and Revelation 19, but there are actually more texts that say we are not to do this. But what is important is to understand the point and purpose of why. God could have used any instrument, but here in the Old Testament, he's using a particular way. And then once we cross into the New Testament, for example, you're going to find specifics, like it's the angel Gabriel that will be speaking to Mary, the mother of Christ, to tell her about the child she's going to have, or to Joseph about his situation with his wife, Mary, or to the mother of John the Baptist, likewise. So you've got the pre, before Christ is born, you're going to have angel, angels appearing and doing specific tasks, but then at some point, we'll jump to end of time, and you'll see the angels functioning in a different way, but in between, in the dispensation we are in, I'm not saying that God cannot and does not. I've, I've not seen an angel. But can God still use angels or angelic beings? Yes. But I think now what God does more prevalently than any other thing is we have one alongside the Holy Spirit, the comforter of God, which in this day, in this dispensation, was not revealed as we know him now. So it's abundantly clear to me that this was a, a tool or a way in which God would communicate amongst many other ways. Remember how Hebrews opens that God in diverse times and diverse ways throughout the course of time spoke in different ways to the prophets, but in this, these last days, has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. That means God, who created everything, can use whatever he wants. I'm sure if he wanted, he could have the birds speak to us. I would like nothing better than to hear from birds instead of politicians. But in in Genesis 24, you have Abraham, who was certain that an angel would help guide the servant he sent to find a bride for Isaac. And it says, the Lord will send his angel with you and prosper your way. So it's safe to say that here in Genesis 24, angels can be used to guide, to direct, to lead. And again, everything that I'm saying will sound strangely like the operation of the third person of the Godhead in the New Testament. But let's not get confused. There are three in one in the Godhead. There always was three in one. And then there are these angelic beings functioning in a different way, in different capacity. But just to show you how many references, Genesis 28 And I'm doing these very, very lightly. But Genesis 28. And remember how Jacob has taken off. He is basically fleeing from his brother Esau, from whom he has stolen, if you will. Esau sold him his birthright for a a bowl of porridge or a bowl of stew. But it says here, Uh, Let me start at verse 10. Jacob went out from Beersheba, went towards Haran, lighted upon a certain place, tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached to the heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, the God of Isaac, and the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. So you've got an interesting depiction of something. Now, his dream and the angels going up and down identifies the real abode of the angels, those not fallen anyway, as in heaven, which... The book of Jude says those who are fallen left kept not their first estate. That's Satan and his band, a third of heaven going with him. So the, uh, the angels are identified as going between heaven and earth, so they've got movement. They're not in prison, incarcerated in heaven, so to speak. 
uh, angels of God, which here explains a greater number of angels involved in, if you want to say it's a dream or it's a representation, but an interesting declaration by Jacob about the stone when he says the stone, which he also calls a pillar, he says it will be God's house. Verse 22 says, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee, a tithe. For all those people who can't read anything regarding the tithe except tithe except what's in Exodus and Leviticus, here's an example of the tithe before the law. But that's not my point. I don't want to get on that. My point is he says, the stone, he set the stone for a pillar which shall be God's house. And I thought very interesting, even in types where Jesus, who is the stone the builders rejected, he is the head cornerstone, He's the stone or the rock that says, come unto me and give me rest. You've got all these beautiful types, but the angels, the message of the angels going up and down speaks volumes. Remember, there's something we have to remind ourselves of. Jacob had not yet been crippled by the angel that he wrestled with. And Jacob at this point is still seen in his old nature as a conniving heel catcher that's always looking for what's best for good old Jacob, which is kind of like most of us. So what I find interesting is that God gives him this vision, vision and well, let's put it in today's terms. He does not appear as a goodly, saintly person. He appears as just a sinner like all of us. See, sometimes we, we tend to put things in the wrong light and we make it, well, this Jacob was, you know, he's in the Bible, so this has to be, you no, know, Jacob also was a piece of work. If you read, and you've got to call him for what he is. And yet God still chose to reveal himself in a, in, in a diversity of ways to this individual who didn't really fit the criteria of, if you ask the church today, is this a good person or is this a good a church member, and they'd say, heck no, get him out of here. We don't want his kind. Well, God didn't have a problem revealing himself to him that way. And I'm not done, but to the most famous passage, perhaps, in chapter 32, where now Jacob, who is worried that his brother Esau, who now he's been alerted to, is coming, and he thinks he's coming for him, and that promise that Esau said he would kill his brother, Jacob now believes is coming home to Ruth. So he sends his family away, Jacob does, in several groups in different directions to make sure that if something happens, if they encounter Esau, not all will be lost. And before he meets up with Esau, that very famous passage we've covered here so many times where in verse 24 of the 32nd chapter, it says, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. Now you notice it says there wrestled a man. We know it was the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, that he was wrestling with. And it is that angel that cripples him. And that crippling would be the reminder of what he was or what he used to be with his new nature now being, now his name goes from Jacob, heel catcher to Israel. Whether you want to translate that a prince who has power with God or God governed, however you want it, it it translates the person from one state to another, which is kind of something we were looking at out of Colossians. So, you know, you wouldn't think about it. We just, we just covered just the book of Genesis alone. And I didn't exhaust all the references. There are, there are references in there. For example, I started this by saying three references on the evil category. Thus far, all the angels we've encountered in Genesis They're all good. They're all there to help the individual. They know about the individual. They have knowledge about the individual. The negative. Let me cover the negative, the three negatives, because there are three questions that some people will say, well, you're only talking about good. Where's the negative? Well, the first negative, of course, occurs in Genesis 3.1 when it says the serpent was more subtle than any other creature. And we know that the serpent which is referenced both in Isaiah and Ezekiel, talks about how he was basically puffed up in pride, but he was splendid in his beauty with every manner of gemstone. He was the the definition of the most beautiful chief musician. We could keep going with those two passages that tell us a lot about 
him in his state before and for his fall. So I include that as the evil part because the individual or the entity that is encountered in Genesis 3.1 is none other than the fallen one, which I started by saying took in that fall a third of heaven in the rebellion with him. The other passage, which is quite problematic, and I'm going to just tell you why it is, and I think I've already alluded to it. In Genesis 6-2, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They basically took them and mated with them and had offspring. Now, why that's a problem is because the Bible tells us that angels in general, in the most specific and generic way, do not reproduce. Remember, Jesus, when he was asked, they said, what, what, well, what will it be like in heaven? And he says they're ne- neither given in marriage. Essentially, they don't procreate. Now, I know there's a great debate about this, so this is what I'm going to leave you with, and you can chew this around and frustrate yourself with it because I'm not going to. But I do believe that in this category of created beings, not all the same. In fact, if we were to break down the categories, we've only actually been looking at the angel of the Lord angel of God, and when we get into more generic terms, there are more, there are more specific or generic terms we could use. For example, in the more specific, the archangel. For example, the archangel Michael or Gabriel. Let's keep going, because I want to show you some more examples. And you might say, oh, I get it, enough. Nope. <laughs> you haven't had enough yet. Exodus. Exodus 3 where it says Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the backside of the desert, came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. I'm going to ask you something. How many of you have read that real carefully? Because we tend to just jump to the fact that the bush was burning but not consumed. And immediately we hear the voice of God. But listen carefully. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Appeared. Eyes, appearance, yes, okay, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. So whatever that was, and he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire. The bush was not consumed. So now God is going to speak to him directly. That's why I said to you, the most, the vast majority of scholars will say, this is God speaking, angel of the Lord, Christophany or Theophany. I'm not going to argue that point. What I do find fascinating here is that we have this appearance and a specific commission. Now, I'm going to blur the lines a little bit because the messenger who first appears becomes the messenger, the definite article messenger, God. And what's interesting is not appearing in human form either. So appearing as a flame of fire and fire, which is commonly associated with these appearances and with God, I want you to think now, when you think about the fire, it's going to bring you to back to the seraphim, which are called the burning ones. Or, for example, and a lot of people are divided on this, whether the pillar of cloud or the, the, the fire and cloud that was sent to the children of Israel, were those representational, actual, and did they represent something like the fire being just like the fire that's the guiding light, or God, our God is a consuming fire. So, Like I said, there's a lot of things to consider. See, anybody who treats this subject as a little pablum homily, you don't have the depth of understanding, and I would highly urge you to look up these references because when you start looking, you realize there's a little bit more here than just, oh, this is a nice little story about an angel appearing or about something that's burning somewhere. From that passage, I'll go to a more known one, Exodus 12, and the Passover. And they were told, the children of Israel, to apply the blood to their doors because, very clearly, what is called here the the destroying angel or the angel of death that would pass through. And if the blood was seen, the angel would pass over and not touch that. But if you read in verse 23... It says here, and the last part of verse 23, and will not suffer the destroyer to come to your houses to smite you. And the destroyer there is the destroyer, the the death angel. 
So again, that, that commandment was given from God to be carried out. So don't think of this as in the evil uh, side of the equation. This still sits on the good side of things. God said, you go about basically about carrying out my business. And that's, uh, it's kind of like one of those things. It seems clear from all of what we're looking at in all the references that God has a specific hierarchy that he uses, at least in these passages we're looking at, to convey, to guide, to protect, to carry out. Now, we have more examples. We definitely have examples and an understanding, for example, that the law, when it was given, there is a passage that says that angels helped to give the law, and that's picked up in both Hebrews, Galatians, and Acts when we talk about the giving of the law. You move into Numbers. In Numbers, we encounter the most famous story there of Balaam pagan prophet. And the interesting thing is that blind to the things of God, he's told by, hired by someone to go and curse the people of God. And he's on a mission to do this person's bidding because he's a prophet for a prophet. Three times, Balaam's donkey refused. Three times because it could see, the animal could see the angel. Balaam could not until God opened his eyes. I love the fact three times, which is divine manifestation, three times, just like Peter's denial, there's all of these types tied into here, kind of mind-boggling. But what is important, that when this person's eyes were opened and they could see, there was actually a turning point. Now, They were paid to go and curse the people of God, but instead turned around and blessed the people of God. And the interesting thing here is it's the driving force of the angel's appearance and making himself known that becomes the important turning point in this passage. If you're interested, that's Numbers 22 through 24 and Numbers 31. And I could keep going. Unfortunately, as I said, time has run out for me. But what I want to tell you is that if you keep reading, you're going to find, if you're looking for it, you're going to find more references out of Deuteronomy, more references when you get into Joshua as an obvious one, which we know that is a Christophany. We've got examples in Jude 2, in, in, sorry, in Judges 2, Judges 6, and the later passage in Judges, which has to do with Manoah and his wife, which has to do about angels visiting the child that's born. So there's, there's a whole plethora of these. They, are, they all appear and come with guidance, direct messages, not ambiguous, but direct messages. They come with naming names, so they have direct knowledge. They appear and disappear. They sometimes have the form of an angel and other times have the form of a man. But we know from, as I started off saying, we're not to worship these, but we're trying to understand. See, underneath this text, you might say, well, why are you telling us about angels? Underneath this text, because in him were created all things, contains both the good and the good that became bad or evil created by him. Now, he didn't create evil, but he created the good, and part of that good became evil. And so we have to understand the two sides. You know, we've dealt a lot with spiritual warfare and the passages of Ephesians 6, where it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, these unseen forces which are dark, evil. Their design is to thwart God's plan to get you off track, to do exactly what they did to Christ. Remember, it was the very essence of Christ's temptation to get him just a little bit off track. These in the evil realm, that's their specialty. And we have the the faith in the one who created it all, who we understand is conqueror of these, if you want to call them, forces, whether they are good or bad. 
So the important thing is to not deny that they exist. Not, by the way, not to live your whole life in looking for the unseen. We walk by faith. But to better understand that in this, this, in this verse, this verse with what is named here will take us to some other understanding about what these people were dealing with at Colossae and most likely at Laodicea as well, teaching that would have basically said, if the angels have these powers, then why not bow down and worship them? Paul's clear clarion cry is no. Christ is the creator of all. He made it all. He must be worshipped in that capacity and nothing less will do. Now, hopefully when we come back again, I will take you a little bit further in this study on good and bad and all that's contained therein so that we might actually have a better understanding. We are fighting the good fight of faith, but it's really good to know what you're up against when you cannot see and you must walk by faith. So hopefully we'll continue to do so and you'll join me next week on this journey through the book of Colossians. But for right now, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030 to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.